Hi, I'm Todd Birchler, a Key Accounts Manager for Ornamentals for New Farm. Here today to discuss fungus gnats and shoreflies and some strategies for successful management. Thanks for taking a few minutes out of your busy day to join me on this journey. So really, what's the big deal with these two diminutive and delicate invertebrates? Well, not so fast. These pests have been implicated in possibly spreading such greenhouse diseases as Pythium blight, Fusarium wilt, Verticillium wilt, black root rot, and even Botrytis blight. And in addition, there is direct damage caused by fungus gnat larvae feeding on plant roots and some unappealing shorefly droppings on plant leaves. Now let's discuss how to properly identify these pests. Fungus gnats belong to the insect family Sciaridae within the Diptera order, with the Verdicia species the common greenhouse version. Fungus gnats are characterized by their slender legs with segmented antenna that are longer than their head. Fungus gnats are about three millimeters long. Their wings are light gray to clear and the Bredicia species wings have a Y-shaped vein. Fungus gnat larvae have a black head capsule with a slender whitish body. Shoreflies belong to the Phydridae family in the Diptera order of insects. They are characterized by short antenna and short legs. And they are about four to five millimeters long and have very conspicuous eyes. The shorefly wings also have pale spots. And the shorefly larva head capsule is the same color as their stoutish body. Now that we know what we're looking at, it's time to turn to Cliffy, everyone's favorite bar know-it-all, for some little-known fungus gnat and shorefly facts. Fungus gnats have overlapping and continuous generations in a greenhouse environment. The female adult egg-laying period is seven days, during which she can lay 100 to 150 eggs. The egg to adult flight life cycle is 25 to 30 days, depending on temperature. Fungus gnat larvae are usually found in the top inch of growing media, but also can be found at the bottom of the container. All plants grown in high peat media mixes are susceptible. Indeed, fresh peat moss may already contain eggs and larvae fungus gnats. Early detection is key as populations can increase rapidly. It is the larval stages that is responsible for plant damage to young seedlings and cuttings. They can damage root hairs and tunnel through roots. On top of all that, the larva may carry such soil-borne pathogens as Salaviopsis and Fusarium and may facilitate the introduction of Pythium cylindrocladium, and sclerotinia. Female shoreflies lay as many as 300 white eggs at a time on algal scum or in very wet areas with decomposing organic matter. Eggs hatch in two to three days and go through three larval stages and one pupal stage. The life cycle is completed in about two weeks and adults can live for three to four weeks. While shoreflies cause no direct plant damage, 
They are known to spread disease spores and their fly specks on plant leaves are certainly undesirable, especially on something like basil. Here are some examples of fungus gnat and shore fly preferred habitat. Wet soil with organic matter and algae covered surfaces. Some of the plant symptoms that can result from fungus gnat infestations can be similar to root rot. They can cause general wilting, off color foliage, leaf distortion and or leaf drop, and general stunting. Here we see fungus gnat larvae feeding on poinsettia roots and some damage to zygocactus. Monitoring is key for deciding if and when control measures need to be implemented. For adults, monitoring is easy with yellow sticky cards. With one to four sticky cards placed every 1,000 square feet at canopy level and checked regularly. Hopper finder tape can work to reduce adult populations. For detecting larva, raw potato discs can be placed on the soil surface at about one disc per 1,000 square feet and checked after 48 hours. Management strategies for controlling fungus gnats and shore flies in a greenhouse will necessarily require an integrated pest management approach. However, it would probably not include Mr. Miyagi's method of fly control. The first key is implementing thorough sanitation practices, which should include using fresh potting media and new containers. Or, if used containers are implemented, the containers should be clean and sanitized. Benches and areas under the benches need to be kept clean of debris, weeds, and algae and should be disinfected with quaternary ammonia or hydrogen peroxide products in between crops. Sanitation protocols should be built into the planting calendar in between crops. The second key is water management. There should never be standing water in a greenhouse. If possible, allow for the soil surface to dry in between irrigations. This is more difficult given the high humidity nature of greenhouses, but proper daily venting helps. Properly training personnel is essential. Irrigators need to understand how the variables of plant type and size, container size and media type, and current environmental conditions all interact to determine how much moisture is needed by the plant. As an underwatered plant is easier to identify than an overwatered plant, Many irrigators err on the side of too much rather than not enough water. Soil wetting agents can play a very important role here. The way they work is to reduce the surface tension of the water, helping to link water repellent soil and water together, which leads to easier wetting and re-wetting of peat-based soils and the added benefit of some water conservation. They also work to maintain an optimum balance between water and air spaces. In addition to sanitation and water management strategies, there are a few more natural strategies to examine, including predaceous natural enemies, such as stratiolilapes, biological controls, including azadiractin products, which is an insect growth regulator, beneficial nematodes like Steiner Nema, Feltidae, and the beneficial bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, subspecies Israeliensis. There are several conventional chemistries available as well. Here is a chemical control chart for fungus gnat. This is helpful in putting together a robust fungus gnat program to visually see the various parameters to consider when developing a program.
So there are a number of conventional con control application strategies to choose from, including biological trenches and sprenches, such as natural, a beneficial bacteria, nemesis and nemeshield, beneficial nematodes, or azadiractin products, which are insect growth regulators, some conventional drenches and sprenches, focusing on the larva as well, include some insect growth regulators such as Distance, NSTAR, Citation, and Azadiractin products, and the Neonix, including Safari, Mallet, Flagship, and TriStar. There are also some total release aerosols focusing on the adults, such as Attain and Pyrethrum. And then we have con conventional foliar sprays with such products as Talstar, Picana, Pylon, and Decathlon. Here are some keys to success when using natural. For a light infestation, a soil drench of 6.4 ounces per 100 gallons repeated at regular intervals will provide long-term maintenance. For heavy infestations, a soil drench of 13 to 26 ounces per 100 gallons made in three weekly applications will help establish control. For under the benches, always treat at the high rates. And do not combine natural with fertilizers or fungicides containing copper or chlorine. And do not apply soil drenches of natural to plants under stress. Do not follow application with excessive amounts of water. Some keys to success using distance IGR, an insect growth regulator, which prevents eggs, larva, and pupa from maturing into breeding adults, is the trench applications only require the top inch to inch and a half of the media to be treated. With a trench sprench treatment, soil surface should be moist at time of application. The sprench rate is three to six ounces per 100 gallons, utilizing 100 gallons for about 5,000 square feet. Treatment can only occur two times per crop cycle, with a minimum of 21 days between treatment. The distance drench rate is two ounces per 100 gallons. Again, it's not necessary to drench the entire soil profile, and at this rate, only one time per crop cycle. Safari provides excellent control of fungus net larva when drenched. In addition, it's broad spectrum and controls many other pests as well. The drench rate for Safari is 12 to 24 ounces per 100 gallons. Only apply to moist soil media, not to dry or saturated media. Use a drench volume that is sufficient to wet soil media without resulting in overflow or runoff through drain holes in the pot or flat. So, in summary, these two small greenhouse pests, if not properly controlled, can cause significant damage to greenhouse crops. Keys to successfully managing them include proper regular sanitation procedures, an effective irrigation program to manage moisture, regular monitoring and record keeping of pest populations, and a thoughtfully designed biological and chemical control regimen as needed. Thank you again for taking the time to learn a little bit about fungus gnat and short flies. Check out some of our other virtual learning series videos at newfarm.com backslash usturf backslash virtual learning. Thanks again.